Week two of the SEC saw a little bit of everything. Some upsets, some exciting games, and some very big disappointments. We will discuss all of that on this edition of the Sting Ray Show as Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered will join us to do a deep dive into the recap of week number two. That's all ahead on this edition of the Sting Ray Show. Guys, we've got a lot to cover this evening, so let's get the Sting Ray Show rocking and rolling. Hi, this is Tim Brando with a reminder. Those of you on Tide 100.9, Look out, you're about to feel the buzz of Stingray. This is Stephen Ray, a.k.a. Stingray, coming to you live from Tuscaloosa, Alabama. I'm Heath Hopkins. I'm here in DeSoto County, Mississippi, right outside of Memphis, Tennessee. You know, Mark, I, I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you feel that responsibility to pay it forward and give some kid a chance coming up in the ranks, kind of like Tony did for you? Why do you think I'm talking to Stingray tonight? <laughs> Thank you, man. I appreciate that. No, I mean, it's look, no. Hey, Stingray, here's the deal. When you get involved with Texas, it's like getting married to a stripper. <laughs> and, and let me explain to you. It looks good. It's kind of sexy on, on the surface. Yeah. But then you get the baggage. You get the drama. You get all that eventually comes with it. And that's what you get with Texas, and that's what the Big 12 learned. And Heath, any thoughts on our show moving forward? Hey, to everyone in Tuscaloosa listening here on Tide 100.9, with the Stingray Show, if you don't like it, you better learn to love it, because it's the best show going today, baby. Woo! And ladies and gentlemen, with all of that, we want to welcome you inside another edition and another week of the Sting Race Show right here on Monday evening. And hey, Heath, let's start something new starting today. I want to start by asking, and you can pick, and then I will pick as well. We are wrapping up the Monday Based off the results of week number two, which fan base had the worst Monday? Mm, I'll just keep it here in the SEC. Uh, I'm an SEC guy. I got to say Auburn, man. I got Mm, you. Not Kentucky? It's bad. It's bad, (laughs) but but Kentucky – I think Kentucky had some questions going in. I know they had a lot of hope and hype yeah. uh, going in and thought, you know, like, hey, we got a five-star quarterback. We're going to be awesome, you know. But I think Kentucky fans kind of knew. And coming off the last couple of seasons, I think they're like, you know, hey, is, it, is, this, is this really all going to click? I think it will. But Auburn fans, I think they thought that this was going to be a step better, a step up, and like, hey, this is the Hugh Freeze we hired. Now we're rocking. And I think now they're like, mm, Hugh Freeze may not be the guy. Like, I'm not saying Hugh's on the hot seat, but I'm saying it's warming up. What about you? I'm going to take it outside of the SEC because I'm going to do you one just a little bit better. Hit me. All right. So week one, we had a reporter come on from The Athletic that said that if this team got a win in College Station, in Aggie Land, which they did, they would be the favorite for the remainder of the season and pretty much a lock for one of the top seeds in the playoffs. That is the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. What did they do on Saturday, Heath? They go home and they lose to the MAC program, Northern Illinois, 16-14 to 14 at home. You cannot do that if you are Notre Dame and be taken serious. You can't. That is an embarrassing loss. But, hey, Marcus Freeman up there is known for doing that a couple of years ago. They beat Ohio State on the road, came back home the next week, and lost to Marshall. You know, Stephen, uh, if you listen to the show and – know just a little bit about us you know i love the maction on wednesday yes night. i love those yes. mac games they are always highly competitive the weather's usually miserable and i love bad weather football on television because i'm sure not going to it right but steven i want to throw this out at you and you're right 
Notre Dame is having a worse Monday than, than Auburn fans. I'm always going to keep mine in the SEC. I'll let you pick a national team each week. But, Stephen, I never get to stay home and watch television. Both my kids uh, had their events. Uh, uh, my son had a Jim Bree football game. My daughter cheered. I was back home before noon, which never happens, yeah. ever, ever. So I was able to watch football all day. I put on, you know, hey, if you don't have YouTube TV, do the four split screen. It's amazing. I watch four football games. Steven, these are the four football games I put on. I made a post about this. I had Cal at Auburn, Northern Illinois at Notre Dame, South Carolina at Kentucky, and, of course, Farmageddon, Iowa State at Iowa. Steven, all four underdogs, all four on the road, all four got the win. How crazy is that? Mm -hmm. That's, I mean, look, we all know, especially in the SEC, road wins come at a premium. So when you drop one at home, that's when the, you know, I don't care who your coach is and how long he's been there. The seat warms up then every single time. My goodness, Steven, those games, those games. Right. Oh, man. But I, hey, I'll tell you this. I might be going, I might be up for me and you going to Farmageddon one day. I don't care one thing about Iowa State. I sure don't care one thing about Iowa. I don't like that fan base. I think they're a bunch of jerks at Iowa. Uh, But I wouldn't mind going to that game. I'd love to see those two fan bases go at each other. Correction. Farmageddon is Kansas State, Iowa State. Is it really? I thought it was Iowa and Iowa State. No, no, no. Well, we're going to change it. That's the Cyclone Trophy. Oh yeah, the Sahawk. The Sahawk. They play for yes, the- correct. Yeah, because Cyclone, you know, Hawkeye, the yeah. Sahawk Trophy. Dude, yeah. did you see Iowa State trying to carry that trophy? No. <laughs> it has to weigh like four hundred pounds. There was like multiple linemen trying to hold on to that thing. I'm like, what do they have in that thing? I know. I mean, is it is it like loaded down with gold? I mean, what? What's in that? That's a heavy, heavy trophy. Yes. And Heath, let's just go ahead and call it. Nobody had a better weekend than the Vanderbilt Commodores going 2-0 and and blowing out and getting the shutout in their win on Saturday. Yeah. You know, I watched uh, some of that Vanderbilt game. Um I'm not going to lie. If you haven't watched uh, Diego Pava, pa- Pavia. Pavia. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Diego Pavia. If you haven't watched Diego, uh, you're missing out. Yes. The, he's a little shrimp of a guy. The kid is a supreme athlete. He's not good. He's not excellent. He's not great. He is supremely awesome. Yes. You, you should watch that kid. He is fun. He is big time fun. I, I, I'll say this, Stephen. I don't care who Vanderbilt plays. I'll tune in and watch a little bit of their game just because of Diego. He's a fun guy to watch. So, Heath, briefly, I do want to mention this. Kentucky, yikes. The transfer portal quarterback thing is not working out for Mark Stoops. Well, I want to say this, Stephen. I've said this on the show before. I have said this for decades. I do not believe in recruiting rankings. Do I believe in recruiting? Yes. Is recruiting important? Yes. I have never once believed in recruiting rankings, ever. I just, you can't, the biggest thing that you can't judge is a kid's attitude and his heart. And you can't judge what happens with that kid when he meets adversity. And so if a kid goes off on campus, if he's a five-star athlete and, and mom passes away and his girlfriend starts dating his best friend, and you know, and and grandpa gets cancer. How's that kid going to react? You know, it, it, you you can't judge those things. That's why I don't put any weight in recruiting rankings ever. Yeah, Brock Vandergriff, a five star quarterback. I think the kid is uber talented. I think that, and you can see that at times. Mm-hmm. I think the kid can do it. I think he just needs some reps and seasoning. But man. That didn't look like a five-star quarterback. It didn't look like a four-star quarterback no. either. And then you see a guy like the Honey Badger, who was like a two-star and the lowest recruiting guy on that LSU uh, class that year. And he was the one that got the most playing time and made all the headlines. 
So there you go. That's why I don't trust recruiting rankings. So, Heath, on that note, we are going to take our first break, and when we come back, we are going to continue to dive into Week 2 action. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to The Stingray Show. We will be right back after this. Residents of Tuscaloosa, are you guys upsizing, downsizing, looking for college housing, or even relocating for your job right here to Tuscaloosa? If that's the case, then you need to contact Celeste Hagler, owner and operator of First Class Real Estate South Home Group, right here in Tuscaloosa. She can help you with the buying, selling, and investment needs throughout the state of Alabama. You can contact Celeste at 205-861-5698. Reach out to Celeste again at 205-861-5698 and schedule a consultation to discuss your real estate goals and to live where you love in the state of Alabama. Welcome back inside the Stingray Show, and let me just go ahead and read off to you guys the wins versus the blah schools this week. Texas A&M beat McNeese State 52-10. to Georgia beat Tennessee Tech 48-3. to Then you down. go on. Yeah, what now? Hunker down. Yeah. All right. Then you go on to Ole Miss beat Middle Tennessee State 52-3. to Mm. You had Missouri knock off Buffalo 38 to nothing. Amazing. You had the Samford Bulldogs lose in Gainesville 45 to 7. Jump, jump. You had a little bit of a struggle with LSU versus Nichols, but they pulled away in the second half 44 <laughs> 21. And then, of course, you had Vanderbilt knock off Alcorn State 55 to nothing. Anchor the rest down. of the Yep. The rest of the games in the SEC were against FBS programs. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. You know, it, it's it's fun to watch. I have not seen a single highlight of the LSU game yet. I yep. got to go watch that and do some research. Steven, I know that first week at summer camp, and we've talked to people on the show. Uh, Chris Phillips was one of the guys I asked. We were going to talk to him here. Uh, uh, again, uh, later this week, but you know, I had problems with Garrett Nussemeyer throwing the ball yeah. down the field, and I, I still have those things. I didn't see any of the highlights this week, but after week one and all the stuff in preseason, I don't know if he can. All right, Heath, this sums up the LSU offense right here 21 rushing attempts, three yards per rush. And for the game, 64 rushing yards. Mm. (laughs) They can't run the football in Baton Rouge. And they can't throw it downfield either. I mean, there's problems there. When I heard in the summer that they were going to run the 12 formation, which is three tight ends. Yeah. I immediately said either they've loaded at running back or they're having problems going downfield because why are you putting three tight ends on the field? Uh, you know, it, it, I was like, mm, you're not stretching the field with three tight ends. Like, that's not no. happening. So that's, mm, Stephen, I think there's trouble in Baton Rouge. And, Heath, I don't know if you saw this or not, but right before the Nichols game, they had to move a defensive star to running back. That's how depleted they are at running back because of John Emery's ACL tear. Well, you know, John Emery was like the third or fourth string back. Yes. You know, another reason why I don't believe recruiting rankings, I think he was a five-star running back coming out of high school, and he's just never done it. Yeah. So, uh, again, you know, dude, there's – I don't know what's happening in Baton Rouge. Like, I know Mm -hmm. last year they had a lot of starters and this and that. You know, I even said during the preseason show, who do we bring on from LSU? Because I like it. Preston. Preston Preston, Guy. Like Preston a lot. 
uh, because he he likes to banter with me and I banter back and we have some great conversations on the show. But I told Preston, I think there's problems on the offensive line. And he's like, oh, no, there's not. No, there's not. And he went through the whole starting lineup and this and that. And I said, you got two five-year, two five-fifth-year seniors, five-year seniors, two (laughs) fifth-year seniors. I was like, "Mm, that tells me you have problems on your offensive line because they're a fifth-year senior and not playing in the NFL for a reason. So, Heath, let's go on ahead and dive into another team that is having some troubles, but they are 2-0 and right now. That is the Oklahoma Sooners. They barely got past Houston on Saturday night. And, Heath, let me say this. Week 1 versus Temple, Oklahoma was 1 of 13 on third down efficiencies Saturday night. Four of fourteen. Yikes, dude. That's that's woof, woof. That's some like nineteen nineties stumbling offense numbers there, man. And that's Brent bad. Venables, Brent Venables was right after the post game interview. They deserve to lose that game as bad as they looked against Houston. As once again, Oklahoma was only able to rush for 78 yards on 28 carries. Yikes, man. So our, so so Oklahoma desperately has some major issues that I think are going to be really exposed, and it could be this weekend when they welcome in Tulane to Norman. Mm. Do Tulane. You don't want to sleep on Tulane. No, sir. I mean, uh, I'm not saying Tulane's going to win that game, but I am saying you better not sleep on them. Right. I, I'll say this, Stephen, and, and no, I'm not taking up for Oklahoma, nor will I probably ever, but <laughs> uh, and I don't hate on Oklahoma. I actually right. enjoy their fan base and, and, the, and the passion that they always bring. Um, here's the thing with Oklahoma. After a game like that, Look, the team knows that they sucked it up. Yeah. The fan base knows they sucked it up. The media knows they sucked it up. The coaches know they sucked it up. Everybody knows they stunk up the joint. You can only do one thing, focus and get after it and make something happen. So you might see Oklahoma come out firing on all cylinders. And I will say this, Nick Anderson, who I think is the best wide receiver in college football, has not played a snap this year. He's been injured. I think that is a key piece, but I think that this team will be super focused coming into the game this week, and I think they're going to get after it, and I think you might see a different sooner offense and team come Saturday. So, Heath, I do want to finish up this the, the segment here talking about my experience at Auburn, and no, I'm not going to talk about how uh, all that stuff. I want to talk about on the play – on the field of Auburn, that team has major issues, and it's not just Peyton Thorne. That defense cannot stop the pass. They cannot run the football. Auburn is an absolute train wreck right now. Now, this weekend, they do host New Mexico, who is 0-2. That is most likely a win for Auburn. But after that, it is Arkansas, Oklahoma, and then Georgia. They could be looking at three straight losses after the New Mexico win. I'm telling you, man, things are not good for Hugh Freeze to start year number two at Auburn. And I guarantee you he's going to have to look at the person behind Peyton Thorne if they continue to struggle at quarterback because that was absolutely one of the worst quarterback performances I have ever seen. You know, Stephen, I'm exaggerating when I say this, but it's not that far off. If Hugh Freeze just lined up the absolute 10 best athletes on the football team there at Auburn, doesn't matter what side of the ball they play on, the absolute 10 best athletes, and just said, you know what? We're running Wildcat the rest of the season. Yeah. And you're going to get two carries, and then you're going to rotate to the back of the line, and we're just going to rotate this over and over and over. This is where I'm exaggerating. 
the offense might be a tad bit better than what we have seen. Yeah. Yes. In the previous two weeks. I think you might have seen better results. With that being said, I know Brian Harson left that program in bad shape. I think Brian yeah. Harson was not able to put in the system that he wanted and was probably told and promised more time. Yeah. Uh, I think he made some mistakes as well, and, and that forced his time to get cut shorter. But Auburn, you've got to give – Hugh Freeze a chance. I mean, look, yes. we're seeing this at Mississippi State with all the coaching changes they had, whether that be death or the Zach Arnett experience not really coming to fruition at all right. last season and Joe Moorhead and his two years. And look, you're you're starting to see it take a toll on the on the on the team mm -hmm. where the program's at as a whole. Auburn, you're doing the same thing right now. Yes. You're bringing in coaches, you're running them off. You're, you're not letting him start and start building, whether that be Brian Harson or whoever. Right. You know, you're going to have to bite the bullet and ride through one bad wave and, and see where you come out on the other side. Florida yeah. Gators, you better be listening because you're about to make the same mistake. We saw the, the you know, McElwain, Mullen, Napier thing, and yeah. it's, it's, it's getting colluded again. Mm -hmm. We saw Tennessee do it for years. Mm -hmm. There, look, they finally settled on the guy. We look, I'm telling you, Auburn, you've got to ride through one bad wave to see if you come out on the other side. You've got to give one guy a chance and give him at least three or four years. Heath, I will finish up this segment by saying this, and this is going to make Alabama fans smile since firing Gus Malzahn. Auburn falls on Saturday to 18 wins and 23 losses. That's a stat I didn't know, but it doesn't shock me at all. Look, you just like we said, Stephen, you've got to ride through one bad wave. You know, did Gus deserve to go? Some say yeah. yes, some say no. I understood it, but I wouldn't have done it. If I was in charge, I would be like, nope, he hasn't done enough to get fired. He hasn't right. done enough to get an extension, but he hasn't done enough to get fired. Yeah. And they made the change, and, man, look what's happening now. They're on their second coach since then, and some people are even talking about a third wanting to happen. 18 wins and 23 losses since the Gus bus left Auburn. Dude. Dude. That's, that's on you billionaire donors. That's every bit on you. Boosters of Auburn, every bit of that on you. So, Heath, when we come back from the break, we are going to be joined by our good friend Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered to continue to dive into week number two recap and then look ahead to week number three. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. Be back in a flash. Man, I love Chris Phillips' takes. I can't wait to pick his brain on a lot of things SEC. Ladies and gentlemen, Bill Ferguson of South's Finest Meats, the official sponsor of the Stingray Show, has a message for you. Everything we do here is fresh and custom-made, custom to order. You know, I tell people when they come in, you know, if you don't see what you like, ask somebody. You know, we've got the capability to process it, make it. You know, if you want a different blend of hamburger meat, We'll do your brisket blend. We'll do your chuck blend. We'll do your sirloin blend. You know, we do all that right here. We are a butcher shop. That's what we do. So please don't be afraid to ask if you don't see what you like. We can make you any size patty you want. We can make you any amounts you want. You know, people come and say, well, how many patties come in the box? Well, ma'am, how many would you like in a box? You know, you want 12, we'll put 12. You want 25, we'll put 25. That's just one of the many things that South's Finest Meats has to offer the official butcher shop of the Stingray Show. It sure is Monday, hitting it now Gotta get myself through the week somehow I had a ball Friday, Saturday, and Sunday But it's all over now, and it sure isn't Monday Welcome back inside the Stingray Show. Now we are about to dive into the recap of week number two of the SEC. And boy, was it a really fun weekend across the conference. 
There was a little bit of nervousness out there, but all in all, it was a wonderful weekend. And in order to do a deep dive, we are about to bring on a familiar voice once again of Chris Phillips of SEC Unfiltered. Chris, how are things going with you as we sit here on Monday evening digesting week number two of the SEC? Stingray, doing well, man. First things first, appreciate you having me on. It was a, always a pleasure to chat with you. But, yeah, what a great week it was, man. Um, you know, every single week I feel like we learn more and more and more about these teams. I mean, the top takeaways, which I'm sure we'll get into, what Texas did in Ann Arbor certainly can't be lost. And anyone, Tennessee's thrashing of NC State, yeah. which I was there in person to see. And not just Nico, but that fantastic defense and that front seven, which we were so excited about. And then South Carolina dominating the Kentucky Wildcats, man. And Shane Beamer yeah. and the Gamecocks all of a sudden are – are 2-0 and and hosting college game day when LSU comes to town. I don't think anybody would have, <clears throat> excuse me, seen that coming. So it, it was a uh, it was a wild week, too, for sure. And I think the, the drama is only going to continue. Chris, let's start with the shocker for me of the weekend on the other side of the state of Alabama at Auburn. California, we did not know much about them. They go into Auburn and completely dismantled the Tigers, causing five turnovers. And Peyton Thorne had one of the worst outings of his Auburn Tiger career. Your thoughts on Auburn versus Cal? I mean, Stingray, I think what you saw firsthand in that 21-14 to loss of the Cal Golden Bears is why I was skeptical on Auburn coming yeah. into the season. I, I just – I was not a believer in Peyton Thorne. I'm still obviously not a believer in Peyton Thorne. I ranked him dead last Stingray coming into this season when it came to my preseason quarterback rankings and, you know, four costly interceptions. Um, you know, you really got to question, honestly, Hugh Freeze's decision to yeah. not go out into the portal and get a quarterback. And I, and I know people talked about, well, he knows they're more than a quarterback away. Well, a quarterback might have helped you win that game, you know? Like, I mean, it, yes. it, even, if, even if it's the difference between seven or eight or nine wins, it would have been worth it to go out and get a guy. So, you know, do they give Hank Brown a look? Does somebody else off the bench? I mean, where do you go from here? I mean, it's it's got – he's – Stingray, at this point, you are who you are, right? Like, yeah. like, at some point, you show me who you are enough, it's up to me to believe you. And Peyton Thorne, he is who he is. And, I, and I'm not saying he won't bounce back and have some positive performances after this, but, like, he's a very average to below average to mediocre college football quarterback. Yes. That's it, especially in the SEC. So it is a shocking loss, no doubt. It's one that I think Auburn folks were kind of joking throughout the week, Stingray, that, you know, um, gosh, will they cover? Will they not? There wasn't even a thought that Auburn right. might lose this game. So to drop this one in what's a pivotal year, two for Hugh Freeze is, is certainly a gut punch. And, Chris, let me also say this. Another glaring issue is the pass defense for Auburn because they absolutely got shredded for 233 yards in the air and 50-50 balls were won by Cal all day because those cornerbacks just would not turn around and look for the football. Yeah, I mean, it was. it felt like everything that could go wrong did go wrong for Auburn. I mean, again, you mentioned – what Jonathan Brady and Isaiah Hunter did on the outside, Hunter with those two touchdown yeah. catches, obviously. And like you mentioned, we just did not know a lot about Cal going in the game. We we took them lightly. We, you know, we I don't know if we even took them seriously. And that that proved to be a, a fatal mistake by all of us. I mean, I, I don't think there was a single SEC personality or single person making picks that took Cal to win that football game. And, you know, give a lot of credit to Cal, man. They're just a lot yeah, better so. than I think everybody gave them credit for. But but certainly when you looked at Auburn's schedule. You looked at that game on the calendar. You felt like that should be one you check off as a W. So, again, to not get it, Auburn's got to make up for it somewhere, and I don't exactly know where on the schedule that comes. <laughs> yeah. You know, to touch on Cal very quickly, didn't Cal – I know Cal beat Ole Miss in one of those games just a couple of years ago. Did they beat them in both, the home and away game? Cal's having a lot of success against the former SEC West with Ole yeah. Miss and now Auburn. I mean, Cal, Cal will be begging – to leave the Big Ten to come here because they think they can win the conference. Sadly, yes. they're catching all these teams that aren't really being that productive. Chris, I'm going to ask you this, point blank. If you're an Auburn fan, what's the most concerning thing? Is it coaching? Is it quarterback? Is it defense? Specialty? What is it 
if you had to pinpoint one thing, what's the most concerning thing for Auburn fans? I mean, I think it's got to be quarterback, Heath. And by the way, to your point, Cal beat Ole Miss in both meetings, 2017 and 2019. One in Berkeley, wow. one in Oxford. To your point, they are having a lot of success against that former SEC West, but it's got to be quarterback play. But I guess the thing, too, Heath, that would really concern me is, like, Q Freeze willingly hitched his wagon to this guy. Like, again, they didn't go in the portal and get a quarterback. Q Freeze has taken control of the offense, and that is still the result we are getting. I, you know, I, I believe in – more so Jimmys and Joes than X's and O's. X's and O's are extremely important. But if you got the Jimmys and Joes, it can cover up a lot of the X's and O's stuff. Peyton Thorne, just not it, man. I, but I, I, I just – I don't know why. And maybe this coaching staff, listen, you know, you felt good after week one. I thought, you know, I know the competition was Alabama a and but I thought Peyton Thorne – you know, Auburn hadn't beaten people like that. So for Peyton Thorne yeah. to go out and make some of the throws he did, you felt like, okay, like that's a positive start, positive momentum. And what we saw was him just – revert right back to what I think most of us thought and expected he would be this season. So quarterback play, Heath, without a doubt, is the most the biggest concern about an Auburn fan. Because if you don't have a quarterback, you don't have a chance in this league. Like games all of a sudden against Arkansas, Texas A&M, they look a lot more difficult than they once did. Because if you can't, again, if you can't get good quarterback play, those are games, and there's many more on the schedule that are easily losable. So, Chris – Let's go on ahead and talk about another team that had a disastrous weekend, and that is the team out of Lexington, Kentucky, that at home hosted the South Carolina Gamecocks and only put up six points in that matchup, losing 31-6. to Where does Kentucky go from here, in your opinion? That is a great question, Stingray, because, yeah. you know, looking at Kentucky's schedule and even talking to Kentucky guys when we were at SEC Media Days in Dallas just a few short months ago, I mean, they made it very clear that this was the game that Mark Stoops and company needed to have, right? Yes. Losing three in a row to Shane Beamer and South Carolina felt inexcusable. It felt yeah. blasphemous. And then to lose the way you did, right? Yeah. And I guess I'm not going to shy away from this fact. I, I called this – the most important game of the season for both of these teams, because I felt like this was a game and maybe even more so for South Carolina because of the difficulty of their schedule, Kentucky also with a tough schedule, but I think it's a little bit more manageable, but this was a game. This was like kind of a trajectory altering type of game for each of their respective seasons. Like I think to hit the goals that each of these teams, these coaching staffs, these programs had set out for this year, this was a game you needed to win. I mean, think about how differently we're talking about Kentucky and South Carolina today. We're talking about the Gamecocks. You're 2-0. You've got college game day and all that talk of is Shane Beamer's seat warming? God forbid is the seat hot. All that has gone by the wayside. And then with Kentucky, you know, what is the trajectory of Mark Stoops' Kentucky program at this point in his tenure? What is it, year 12, I think? It's like, what are we doing now in the Mark Stoops tenure? Is this going to be a program who's – ascending up to eight or nine wins and challenging for college football playoffs, is Kentucky going to kind of fall back to being a, a, a fringe bowl team? Yeah. And I think we started to get our answer on Saturday. So, I mean, it was a dominating performance by South Carolina in all aspects. You know, Chris, not- he, let me say this briefly. This sums up the entire game. Brock Vandergriff, three of ten for 30 yards, one interception. That's it. Yeah, I mean, South Carolina's defensive front, guys, was absolutely incredible. I think it's really time – and we're going to learn more, right, when they take on LSU. That'll be the best offense they've seen. But, I mean, it's really time we give the Roses to Clayton White and that South Carolina defense. Guys, listen to this, the aggressiveness. Kentucky had 22 dropbacks in that game against South Carolina. The Gamecocks brought some form of pressure on every dropback except two. I mean, they were sending the house – but when yeah. you're feasting on the cats like you were and you're, you're up in Brock Vandergriff's grill and, you know, forcing him into some bad decisions, why wouldn't you do that? So it's it, you really got to tip the cat with the defense. And, you know, while, while they're still kind of figuring things out offensively, hell of a job by that defense to really, you know, carry the weight and put the team on their back and, uh, you know, lead that team to a victory. Two quick things before we head to break, Stephen. One, Brock Vandergriff, super young quarterback. Yeah, he's going to get blitzed a lot. And now he's going to get blitzed even more. And two, Kentucky fans, hey, before you run off stoops, you better remember what you were. Look at Mississippi State. 
Dan Mullen left. They hadn't been the same since. So, Heath and Chris, on that note, we're going to take another break. And when we come back, we are going to continue to dive into the SEC in week two and talk about the big Texas win and Arkansas choking on the road. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will continue right after this with Chris Phillips. Deer season is fastly approaching, I do realize that, but do you guys know that fall is the best time to stock your lake with largemouth bass and or grass carp for weed control to get ready for fishing in the spring? If you need a load of largemouth bass, be sure to contact Jeff Bagwell and Honey Hole Fisheries. Now, Jeff Bagwell is a biologist and can be contacted at 205 799 Once again, that is 205-799-0192. Contact Honey Hole Fisheries today to get you a load of largemouth bass to your lake or pond. Welcome back inside the Sting Race Show. We are going to continue now with our breakdown of week number two in the SEC. Our guest this evening is Chris Phillips. But before we get to Chris, Heath, we were talking off the air. You've got something that you want to say about Arkansas choking on the road in Stillwater, Oklahoma having a 21-7 to lead and losing it. Heath, the floor is all yours. Say your piece about the Arkansas Razorbacks. Look, I live right here next to Memphis, Tennessee. There are a ton of Arkansas fans. We border Arkansas. I can be in Arkansas in 20 minutes from my driveway. There's a ton of Arkansas people here. There's a ton of friends that I have that are Arkansas fans. You are 100% wrong, Arkansas fans, about Bobby Petrino. Oh, we had over 600 yards of offense. It's not the offense's problem. Bull crap. Well, turn your radio up again, Arkansas fan. Bull crap. Listen here. Bobby Petrino will move the ball between the 20s all day long. Between 30 and 30, he's going to be moving it big plays. But when he gets inside that 30, He can't do Jack Diddley poo squat with the ball. You think I'm wrong? Go back and watch that game. When you got inside the 25-yard line, you did absolutely nothing the entire day. Twice in overtime, none in the second half. You did nothing. You can score from far, Bobby P. You can score from far on that motorcycle all day long. But you get in in between the 20s, You can move it. You get inside those 20s, you can't do anything. Bobby Petrino is the problem with that Arkansas team on Saturday. It was Bobby Petrino, not Sam Pittman, not any player. Special teams did not help. I'll say that. But Bobby Petrino, your offense sucks. I said it. I own it. I wear it. And you'll have to deal with it, Arkansas fans. Suck on that. Chris, how do you follow that up, man? Well, you know, I don't know if I'm willing to say that an offense that generated 648 yards sucks, but I respect it. I respect it. I do. <clears throat> Guys, this one really, really hurt my soul watching this. I, I took Arkansas straight up. I picked the hogs. I was embracing the hog, man. Right, wrong, or indifferent. This one made me nervous, and you saw why. I mean, it just – man, I, they did everything they could to lose it, and they did Right, the turnovers were killer. I mean, it's crazy. You look at the stat sheet in this game, and yeah. Arkansas dominated in every facet. It, just yeah. from the stat sheet, I mean, I agree. Thirty-three to twenty-one first down, six forty-eight to three eighty-five total yards, four sixteen to three twenty-six of the year, two thirty-two to fifty-nine. Like guys, if you would have presented me this stat sheet before the game and said, "What's the final score?" I would have said Arkansas won this game by three touchdowns, if not more. So. To, to find a way to lose. I feel like Arkansas more so lost that game than Oklahoma State won it, if we're being totally honest. Um, you know, in the red zone certainly was a problem. Special teams is a problem. 
I mean, the turnovers were just killer, though, man. And it, and yeah. it just seemed all day. It was really, really sloppy football. I mean, listen, I'm still really excited about Taylor Green. I love the way Jaquindon Jackson runs the football. Like, Arkansas is going to give some people fits, but now the question is just going to be, can they close? Can they finish? That's going to be the big question for them. So I, I just wonder, how do you rebound from this? How do you respond? Uh, there's still obviously a lot to play for for the Hogs, but this was this was a huge missed opportunity, man. I mean, you just you had the game there for your taking, and it slipped right through your fingers. Chris, I'll give Arkansas credit. I would not be shocked if there's a stat out there, and I'm sure there is, that between the 20s, Arkansas has the number one offense in America. Wouldn't be shocked at all. Inside the 20, they have got to be a bottom 10 team. Yeah. In the red zone, they have to be. I mean, time after time after time after time after time. After time and I'm like, do you not have – hey, look, we all know that we have goal line plays. We have two-point conversion plays. Do we not have plays for inside the 20, Bobby Petrino? If you can't stretch the field, you can't do anything. And that's why it didn't work at Missouri State. That's why he failed at Louisville in his last few days. Bobby Petrino is a fossil in the offensive college football world. In between the 20s, hey, it's, it's big-time living. Inside the 20s, you ain't scoring, just like Saturday. Yeah, and that's the money zone, man. You got to be able to convert there. So, yeah, to your point, that's that's going to be a huge issue for them moving forward. Chris and Heath, let's go to another game that was extremely disappointing. But I do think we have to realize that Zach Arnett did not leave the program very well. Let's go out west and talk about Arizona State knocking off Mississippi State. And Mississippi State did not show up until the second half. Chris, your thoughts on Mississippi State moving forward. And I will say this, the emphasis needs to be on their defensive side of the football. Yeah, I mean, Stingray, that was my big concern coming in the season, right, with with yeah. Coleman Hutzler, first-time defensive coordinator, two returning starters on that side of the football. I mean, we know how new things are, obviously. And, and Starkville, and to your point, you just put yourself behind the eight ball in this game. I mean, it's 27-3 before you can even blink, obviously, going into the yeah. half. And credit Mississippi State, obviously, for making a you know making a push late there in that ball game. But yeah, it's it's got to be better defensively. Um, Three hundred and fifty nine rushing yards. I mean, Cam Scadabo, thirty three for two sixty two, and averaged eight yards per carry. Right. I mean, they only yeah. threw for sixty nine yards. They didn't have to throw it though. I mean, that, that's the thing. They just they just didn't have to throw it. So uh, Mississippi State's got to find some answers up front. They got to find some answers defensively. I mean, Isaac Smith had a big game with seventeen total tackles, but that, it was just. You know, you give up over 300 yards rushing, you ain't going to win many football games that way. So, it was again, it was another missed opportunity. Um, I think it's one where, guys, again, I'm not totally surprised because I knew if there was going to be an issue on this team, this was going to be it. But, you know, guys, when we looked at the path for Mississippi State making a bowl game this season, winning your non-conference games yeah. kind of felt like a must. Uh, and now, all of a sudden, you know, you drop this one on the road to an Arizona State team that, again, Scadabo's a really good player, but – I didn't think they were all that great. I, yeah, I don't. I don't think Arizona State's like a bunch of world beaters or anything. So it's a, it, it's it's a tough loss early in the Jeff Levy era. But you know, defensively, we knew that was the issue. It's got to get tightened up. To back up what you just said, Chris, um, Arizona State is an underdog to Texas State this weekend. This yeah. is not a great Arizona State team. Look, I, I texted Stephen and go exactly what you just said, Chris. I texted Stephen during the first game of Mississippi State. I said, this D-line is just absolutely atrocious. It is very, very bad. And I've made the statement to multiple people, and they said no. They're like, no, man, no. I said, I said, if you are almost average running the ball, you'll have a great day against Mississippi State's D-line and defense. That defense is so slow. That front seven is incredibly slow. Either that or they're taking the worst angles ever in football. But, yeah, if you can run the ball – just almost average, you will have huge success against Mississippi State. So there you yes. go. Yep. So, Chris, let's go on ahead and talk about the sloppy performance for the majority of the game until they pulled away in the, in the fourth quarter, the Alabama Crimson Tide, man. What did you make about that performance against South Florida? I don't think Alabama wants to see USF ever again. I no. I, don't don't schedule them moving forward. You know, guys, it was kind of funny. We caught a lot of flack for insinuating that South Florida was 
you know, a really good G5 team could be the G5 team in the college football playoff. But, you know, we gave Byron Brown a lot of love. And, I mean, I think you saw why, guys. Like, I mean, I, I think he might be the best G5 quarterback. You know, I think he might be the best quarterback at that level. So, you know, it, it, guys, in games like these, I mean, listen, you're like a 30-point favorite. I'm not going to sit here and, you know, I'm not going to take – too much away from, but you know, listen, it's it's fourteen to thirteen going to the fourth quarter. I mean, again, I don't think Bama fans want to see South Florida on the schedule ever again. You're obviously able to score, put up a twenty eight spot in the fourth quarter, but you know, I, I mean, give credit to South Florida, but also too, guys, it's it's early in the Kalen DeBoer era, and there's going to be some loose ends and things to get cleaned up. And I think you saw that, man. Jam Miller looked fantastic in the game. You know, I thought the running game was really solid. We didn't quite see those those big explosive plays down the field. I know Ryan Williams did have a big one. Um, and Ryan Williams continues to be one of the most fun players to watch in the SEC, by the way. He is yeah. he's an electric factory. But, yeah, that game was a lot closer, guys, and that score indicated. And certainly if you put that type of effort again out there and you start slow, Wisconsin can beat you. I, I don't think yes. it's going to happen most likely, but they can absolutely beat you. So um, the big thing for Bama is this, get it all cleaned up, get everything fixed where you take on Georgia. That's going to be the real test for this team. All right. So, guys, we are up against our final break. And, Chris, when we come back with you, we are going to talk about Texas versus Michigan and then flip the page to week number three. That's on the other side of the break. You're listening to the Stingray Show. We will be right back to finish up this episode. Your life can change on a dime, and if you are relocating for your job up to the rocket city of Huntsville, the fastest growing city in the state of Alabama, you need to contact Celeste Tegler of First Class Real Estate South Home Group. She has brokers all over North Alabama to help you get settled with buying a new home in North Alabama. You can contact her at 205-861-5698. Once again, that is Celeste Tegler, 205-861-5698. 698. Contact Celeste Hagler today to live where you love in the state of Alabama, even in the rocket city of Huntsville. Welcome back inside of our final segment right here on the Stingray Show. Our guest this evening is Chris Phillips from SEC Unfiltered. And Chris, before we get to the Texas Longhorns, I want to get your take on how surprised you are that Vanderbilt is probably staring 3-0. and oh. Yes, you heard me, 3-0 and oh, going into the Missouri game because they knocked off Alcorn State 55 to nothing this past weekend. They've got a game this weekend versus Georgia State. Your thoughts on Vandy for the first two weeks of the season? I mean, guys, listen, through two weeks, we're talking about Vanderbilt as not the worst team in the conference. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean that that sounds kind of silly to say, but that's a victory, I think, for Clark Lee and company. Obviously, the week one, they were the the shocker of the college football world, taking down Virginia Tech the way they did, what they did to the Hokies. And, you know, I think we all expected Vandy to, to beat Alcorn State, but it's a, it's a positive sign when you go out there and don't just win, but dominate in the way they did. Uh, the legend of Diego Pavia continues to grow. Um, you know, you rushed for 242 yards in that game as well. I think defensively, I've been really impressed with them. Um, they're very active up front this year. The safety play is really, really solid. And I think Clark Lee taking over the defense has, has been a huge positive. So, I mean, guys, listen, college football is crazy. It's never been more unpredictable in my mind. You think about what they have upcoming up at Georgia State, I think can be a tricky game, but I think it's yes. one if he can win, be three and oh. And go into Columbia, Missouri with a crazy amount of momentum. I'm, I'm not calling my shot right here, but you just never know what can happen. So I will tell you this, guys. I feel more and more confident that Vandy is going to get a conference win this year. I don't know who it's going to be. I don't know which game. I don't know what crazy upset it might be. But this is a dangerous Vanderbilt team. I, mm-hmm. I'm, I'll, I'll be curious to see how they fare in SEC play. But give credit to Clark Lee and company a year coming in again, guys, where there was real pressure. and. People were wondering, you know, which direction is the program going? And 
congratulations to all those who took the over two and a half on Vandy and Vegas win total because there's a good chance you hit that this weekend. So it's it's been a lot of fun to watch, man. I mean, what they did in week one and obviously following it up the right way and need to do so again with Georgia State. But crazy to think we're, we're living in a world where Vandy just went, very well might be 3-0 and in a couple of days. You know, we're not going to do this uh, for the season. There's not an award, is what I'm saying, for uh, MVP after two games in the SEC. But who is playing better than Diego at Vanderbilt in the SEC right now? Because my vote would go to him. Who's doing better than him? Did you see the quote that he had where he said that Brent Pry, the Vatek head coach, compared him to uh, Trace McSorley, the former Penn State quarterback? And yeah. they asked him about it. He said, no, I, I look at myself, I'm more like Johnny Football. <laughs> think, of the, think of the confidence you have to have, Heath, to compare yourself to Johnny Football. Like, not my game is more like Johnny Football. Right. I, I just – I love the confidence, the swag. You know, Vandy forever has been kind of that little guy picked on bottom of the conference. Yeah. They need a guy like that to kind of lift them up. And, you know, just think about the positive impact that's happening in the locker room. So, that dude's playing with extreme confidence, and he's playing well, and that, that's a dangerous combination. We won't chase this rabbit long, but think of this bizarre world that we live in that Hugh Freeze can't get a quarterback to move his offense, but yet Clark Lee at Vanderbilt can through the transfer portal. Hey, Auburn fans would love Diego Pavio on their sideline. Yes. And they are terrified that they got to face him again this year on the Plains after last year. I, I would say 85 to 90% of college football would love to have Diego on Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt Auburn is going to be an incredible game for the storylines alone. Mm -hmm. Truly. Mm -hmm. So, Chris. Let's go on ahead and dive into the final game from this past weekend. Texas dismantled Michigan at the big house. They ran the students out of the stadium before the fourth quarter. Your thoughts on Quinn Ewers and Texas's dominant performance in Ann Arbor? Masterful. I mean, that was a statement. Yeah. The statement was made there, but I, I don't care what you think about Michigan. You know, I saw people trying to write off that win. Oh, it's Michigan. Guys, we're talking about the defending national champions in yeah. their house. In their house. And, and the you went in there and beat them like a drum. That game was never in doubt. I mean, yeah. never in doubt. Quinn Ewers, guys, was efficient. He took care of the football. Um, I thought this could be the breakout game for an Isaiah Bond. I thought he looked really good. Gunner Helm, the tight end, was fantastic. That's kind of another yeah. weapon that I think is – is really slept on under the radar mm -hmm. weapon. Matthew Golden was really good for them as well. Was really happy to see happy to see Jaden Blue come back after he had that injury early in the game. They obviously can't afford to lose any more bodies at running back. But yeah, Quinn Ewers was the star of the show. And guys, that defense as well. I, I thought that defense yes. did a really good job slowing down Donovan Edwards. You know, I think the big thing that helped him in that is obviously you jump out of the big lead. You made Davis Warren and Michigan throw the football, but statement made by Hookham. This isn't just a team competing for the SEC title, guys. This is a national championship caliber football team we've got in Texas. All right. And, Chris, my final question for you is this. Looking at week three, here are the marquee games. Alabama at Wisconsin, LSU in South Carolina, and Gigham Aggies in Gainesville versus Florida. Of those three, which one piques your interest the most? Well, guys, I'm going to take the cop-out answer and go South Carolina LSU at williams Bryce Stadium because we will be at that game. Uh, and looking forward to, to being in Columbia. College game day will be there. I, I feel like there's a many different entities that are that are making that their site in week three. But, uh, no, it, it's – you know, that one truly on the field too. I, I think that's probably got the opportunity to be the closest game. I would say second most intriguing – would be that Florida A&M game just yeah. because we know how desperately Florida needs that. You know, Texas A&M as well after losing week one, right, they're trying to generate some positive momentum. This is the first ever SEC game for Mike Elko. Alabama-Wisconsin, I mean, I think early on could be interesting. I, I, I If any of them is going to get lopsided, I think it could be that one. I think Bama could yeah. pull away. I just don't know how Wisconsin's going to move the football consistently enough. But South Carolina LSU, guys, I, I feel like there's still a lot of things I'm unsure of when it comes to LSU. and then. South Carolina, it's kind of like, how good are they really? You know, like we we know they're better than Kentucky now. We know that this South Carolina team is probably better than the the preseason prognostications and predictions made them out to be. But right. you know, is this a six and six team? Is this a team that could surprise and win eight or nine games? I mean, a game right. like this against LSU 
It's massive for Shane Beamer and his program to get college game day on site, to get all the attention on you. All you can ask for in life, guys, is the opportunity and what an opportunity it is for South Carolina to, to again, really make a statement. And, again, for LSU to get off the schneid. Guys, their backs are against the wall. There's no more wiggle room if you want to make a college football playoff yeah. because you've still got Ole Miss. You've still got Bama on the schedule. you got to be able to go into Columbia and take care of business and what will be a hostile environment. Yes. You know, I'll throw this out there about Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks. If they happen to lay an egg on Saturday, which I don't think they will, but if they happen to lay an egg, that's not going to be the worst thing for the South Carolina team. They might get overcaught in the moment. They might just play a bad quarter and lose the game, whatever. But I think a lot of people will go back and start sleeping on South Carolina. You better not sleep on Shane Beamer and the Gamecocks this year. This team is legit. And I'm a little bit surprised, Chris, by the team speed uh, of the South Carolina team. I was watching that the other day, and I was like, this team's not slow. They, I mean, yeah. they've got they've got some burners here on both sides especially, of the ball. Especially defensively. I, guys, I thought the best thing they did was they upgraded their athleticism in the front seven. And, I mean, you're seeing that. I mean, guys, Dylan Stewart, who is becoming a household name just two weeks in, guys, he's the best edge rusher in Columbia since Jadavion Clowney. I, I feel very I agree. in saying that. I mean, the way that kid moves – uh, to be such a young player, and people are getting their jabs in on social media. What school is he going to be at next year? But I think what people have to realize, this kid had offers from everywhere, and he chose to go to Columbia. So, I mean, he's he's a pleasure to watch. Kyle Kennard, another big pickup they had in the portal. And they've got the defense to beat LSU. Um, again, that, that, that matchup is most intriguing to me. LSU's offense against South Carolina's defense, I, I'm really, really excited to see them go toe-to-toe. So, Chris, look, man, enjoy covering the SEC storylines. And, hey, we're going to have you on later this week to preview the South Carolina versus LSU game from the South Carolina's perspective. So we will catch up with you on Thursday evening, my friend. Let's do it, guys. Appreciate you all. Thank you all so much for having me. Okay. Chris, have a great week, brother. Appreciate you all. All right, so Heath, that is going to wrap up the Monday evening edition of the Stingray Show. We really hope that you guys have enjoyed it. When we come back tomorrow evening, we are going to be doing a deep dive into the week three matchup that is in Gainesville between Texas A&M versus Florida. Graham Hall from Florida is going to join us and Olin Buchanan from Texas A&M to break that game down from both sides. That is on the Tuesday evening edition of the Stingray Show. Guys, have a wonderful Tuesday out there, and the Stingray Show will see you tomorrow evening.